Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Versus, the show that today features a regal rumble of royalty in the world of acting. That term world may not actually be big enough for our two featured thespians today because at least one of them owns property in a galaxy far, far away, and the other one may well have created the entire known universe. I mean, we got God and Darth Vader. That's a pretty good matchup. Who wins? I'll refrain from answering that existential query and instead introduce you to today's guests, Morgan Freeman and James Earl Jones. I'm your host, Mark Ellis, and if you think my voice is pretty commanding, wait until you hear from those two. Don't make me destroy you. I've been expecting you. As usual here on Versus, neither star will be appearing here in person. Could they, uh, could they send up a voicemail? I'd listen to that. We all would. I've been waiting for decades. Technically, this program is a competition, but it's really just an excuse to honor two of the all-time heavyweights in terms of cinema, theater, penguin activity narrating, and news program introductions. This is CNN. It isn't always the case that two pop culture icons are also a couple of the most respected performers in the history of, you know, performing. They've been relevant for seemingly as long as Dionysus, and now we get to honor their esteemed resumes by making them fight. Look out, Morgan. James has a wicked right hook after portraying real-life boxing legend Jack Johnson. But then Jones has to beware of Freeman, too. He may have wanted that quiet, retired life in Unforgiven, but if Clint Eastwood shows up needing a favor, you know what? They're both great. My life wouldn't be the same without either of y'all. And does my voice sound higher than normal today? <laughs> Maybe it's just in comparison to Morgan and James. If there's a round table in Hollywood, these two incredible actors are definitely knights seated at it. Here's how we'll determine a winner. Round one, box office. Round two, tomato meter slash audience score. Round three, iconic roles. Round four, penguin suits. And then we'll do a wild card round that could involve anything from sports movies to biopics to whose Kevin Costner film is better. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, taking on Field of Dreams? Well, Kev's accent plays better in the baseball movie, but in Robin Hood, we get Morgan Freeman vaulting over a wall courtesy of a catapult launched by Christian Slater. F me, he did clear it, and both these legends have cleared every bar there is to vault over in Hollywood. Movies, stage, screen, earth, Mustafar, they've conquered it all, and their films, even ones made decades ago, still seem to be prominently featured in today's rotation of beloved films and performances. I was trying to get deeper in my register there, but you know what? I'll leave the command of narration to the pros while I radio DJ my way through five intense round of verses, and Caller 12 is going to win those Spin Doctors tickets. Two princes of performance are about to duke it out here, and you can get involved. Comment with your favorite Morgan Freeman role, the best of James Earl Jones's catalog. Have at it below. If the like button is there, I guess you click it. My voice is going too high. I'll figure it out, but for now, it's time to get it on. Thank you. Good luck. Round one, box office. For decades and seemingly centuries, folks have been lining up around the block, busting into theaters to witness the greatness of Morgan Freeman and James Earl Jones on the big screen, even if some audiences weren't aware that they would be blessed with a performance from either GOAT. These guys are awesome, whether appearing in physical form or if it's just their vocal cords cashing the paycheck. Either way, those efforts will factor prominently into this round that's all about putting butts in seats. Star Wars was pretty good at that. Not only was A New Hope a cultural phenomenon when it was released in the summer of 1977, so much of that business was repeat customers flocking back for more Darth Vader badassery. David Prowse's imposing visage inside a shiny black costume was scary enough, but then that machine more than man talked? Chills dripped down the spine of every rebel scum and moviegoers to this very day. Don't act so surprised, Your Highness. Star Wars tractor beamed in $775 million worldwide in 1977 money, making it the highest grossing film ever at the time. Yet now in the year, what year is it? 2023 already? God, that calendar flies. Here and now, that hall is just good enough to be Jimmy's, I shouldn't call him that, my bad. Apology accepted. His fifth best effort. His top four include two Lion Kings and two other Star Wars movies. The live action, I guess, 2019 Lion Effort is King here with a $1.6 billion feast. Then we have The Rise of Skywalker, which has a few Vadery notes, and Rogue One, which has some wonderful Darth Punnery, both leaping over the billion dollar hurdle, and then the 1995 OG Lion King, which roared to $986 million. The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi team up to make another billion bucks for Jones, but he wasn't done sitting on a throne just yet. Coming to America, in which he plays the King of Zamunda, got to $288 million. He does well as an admiral, too in Tom Clancy smashes like The Hunt for Red October, Patriot Games, and Clear and Present Danger. That trio would combine for almost $600 million in U.S. coin. Oh, and he's a judge in Summersby. Remember that movie? Jodie Foster is Richard 
Gere, her hubby or not. I mean, I don't know a ton of ladies that would complain about Richard Gere showing up. It's a big movie for the 1990s, and it earned 140 million bucks. Very well. Okay, so Morgan Freeman has quite a task ahead of him. James Earl Jones had the benefit of performing in huge space fantasies, epic Disney adventures, and international espionage bangers. Can Freeman keep up? Well, if he's got that Batmobile Tumblr thing, probably. He's tech whiz Lucius Fox, an all-time great name in Christopher Nolan's Batman trilogy. Those movies perform well. I'm told. Batman began with a nice $358 million jog. Not bad. Then Joker showed up. The Dark Knight maniacally laughed all the way to the bank with a $1 billion deposit, then filled the other vault with another bill courtesy of The Dark Knight Rises. James Earl Jones is awesome as a king. Freeman is pretty darn believable as God. Is this heaven? No, oh, this is Mount Everest. You should flip on the Discovery Channel from time to time. Bruce Almighty earned almost $500 million, Evan Almighty tacked on another $174 million, bucks, and as the President of these United States, he fares well too. Deep Impact rocketed to $349 million, and then the Gerard Butler Fallen franchise, where Freeman, I think eventually assumes the role of Commander-in-Chief, if I'm not mistaken, minted over $500 million in that three-film stretch. Oh, and Morgan also does some ADR. That's what we in the good throat biz called voiceover, and any human or penguin will tell you that his gravelly rasp adds gravitas to any situation. The penguin. <laughs> War of the Worlds sucked up over $600 million, The Lego Movie built a $468 million total, and wobbling to $133 million in 2005 was La Marche de l'Empereur, also known as March of the Penguins. Did y'all know I spoke fluent French? Well, the answer is oui, madame. Je te aim. I spent a few hours at Charles de Gaulle Airport one time. First class lounge, one of the best showers I've ever had. Was I supposed to be there? I don't think so. Okay, so we've established that in front of the camera or behind a microphone, Morgan and James drive big business to the local multiplex. But who reigns supreme as king or president or God itself? Jones has accrued $8.8 .8 billion at the box office over a legendary career, but Freeman has amassed $11 billion. James does have the higher per movie average at $196 million per picture to Morgan's $149 million. But I lean on me towards Morgan Freeman here for no other reason than He's appeared in a few more big time movies, and Jones was seriously in Rise of Skywalker for like a line. I have been every voice you have ever heard inside your head. It was a good line to be sure, and that movie's great. You hear me, Internet? It's awesome. Wonderful close to the greatest saga of all time. But Morgan Freeman gets the win in round one and goes up one to nothing. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Round two, tomato meter slash audience score. God has the lead and that ain't gonna make Darth Vader happy one bit. But when you think about it, does anything make Vader happy? Like the guy never smiles. You got your death, you got destruction, protesting sand. I don't like sand. I guess he does enjoy flying his custom GT Shelby TIE Fighter, but will that aid and abet him in round two, which is all about how the critics and audiences felt about your movie after the bag of popcorn had been munched? Yeah, the galactic operas tend to do well, according to George Lucas and Disney's wallet. And the tomato meter, the best Star Wars movie of them all, in an unofficial poll I just took in the men's room 30 minutes ago, is Return of the Jedi at a rock solid 83% on the tomato meter. A New Hope is at 93%, and The Empire Strikes Back tops here with 94%, but Jones's best role in the veggie Patch was as Lieutenant Lothar Zog in Dr. Strangelove, which is 98%. You don't have to love the bomb, but we can all stop worrying about whether King Joffe would be competitive in this round. By the way, Coming to America is at 73%. The sequel's rotten at 49%. Why? It's fun. Wesley Snipes shows up. But we find fresh fare again with flicks like Field of Dreams at 88%, Cry the Beloved Country at 85%, and the animated, as in drawn on paper with maybe a little bit of a PC helping, the 1994 Lion King is at 93%. It's a good start for Jones. Now for the counter by Morgan Freeman. He was in Transcendence. Ew. And Chain Reaction. Uh, you know what? Let's start at the top, please. He narrated three movies that are 100% fresh on the tomato meter, highlighted by the sequel to La Marche de l'Empereur. They're so cute wearing their little tuxedos. And his vocal talents in the Lego talk, he helped construct a 96%, tying it with Unforgiven, which is a very different movie, but no less, well, awesome. Gone Baby Gone is 95% on the tomato meter. Glory is 94%, and The Shawshank Redemption is 91% on the TM, and 150% according to every college student and Ted Turner's bevy of networks. I dare you to turn that movie off if you stumble upon it on the boob tube. That's what we used to call television. Get your minds out of the gutter. And stop wasting my time.
Of his Batman efforts, Lucius notched 94% with The Dark Knight, 87% with The Dark Knight Rises, and 84% with Batman Begins. What? How is the last one better than arguably the best origin story in comic book film history? If only there was a podcast where talented minds and syrupy voices could argue about whether or not Rotten Tomatoes is wrong. Other fresh highlights for Freeman include Driving Miss Daisy at 84%, Seven at 82%, and Invictus, where he plays Nelson Mandela at 76%. I know what you're asking. Where's Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves? That way. Well, it better be fresh. It's one of the best movies of the 1990s. 50%? Are you kidding me? Luckily, there's a podcast called, oh, I already plugged that, damn it. But this is why we also have the verified audience score. I'm sure on this metric, the injustice committed by the Sheriff of Nottingham will be rectified and it's 72% here, that's just fresh, but not enough. Come on, Morgan Freeman, Catapult, Christian Slater, enough set. Shawshank is even higher rated with the normies, tunneling out at 98%, followed by Seven's 95%. The Dark Knight and Batman Begins are tied at 94%. Yeah, the audience knows what they're talking about. And a trio of movies at 93%, including Unforgiven, Glory, and Angel Has Fallen. What? I knew I liked your audience score. Now I love you. Return of the Jedi, Return of the King, Angel Has Fallen. Great trilogy closers. The Mariana Rivera of their respective franchises. I don't have any idea what that means. All right, let's all welcome to the plate James Earl Jones. Now, the concept of the relief pitcher wasn't in vogue back in the olden days when Shoeless Joe Jackson was playing ball, fair and square, but Field of Dreams is still throwing heat with an 86% in the audience aisle. The Sandlot, speaking of baseball movies, Beast sits way to 89%, and The Lion King from the 90s is in the 90s at 93%. Return of the Jedi is 94% here. You see, the audience gets it. Tying it with Doc Strange, Love and Rebound, the legend of the goat, as in the Earl Manigault story. He was a real street baller whose feats on the blacktop have been etched into mythology for all times. One time he took a $20 bill off the top of a backboard. Your move, John ja Morant. I don't know what you're talking about. A New Hope grizzles its way to a 96%, and Empire tops the Star Wars galaxy once again with an audience approved 97% fresh. I love these dudes so much. It pains me to highlight some of their low lights, so we're gonna go quick and rip the Band-Aid off. Apparently, J.E.J. -E was in a sequel to Casper, which died on the table at 0% on the tomato meter. Silence! Three Fugitives is at 14%, and The Meteor Man is at 25%. I like that one. Comedy legend Robert Townsend, right? It climbs to 36% on the audience score, so you know what, maybe I got that one wrong. Morgan Freeman's dubs include Transcendence, which I cannot stress enough, is just not good, 19%. Chain Reaction is good, according to me, Keanu Reeves, and Rachel Weisz, but the lab results have it at a mere 18%. Run the test again. And the contract with Morgan Freeman and John Cusack is as low as fidelity can get, 0%. May God have mercy on your soul. Luckily, Freeman plays a pretty good deity, so you might have an in. All told, James Earl Jones is looking to get on the board with an overall tomato meter average of a fresh adjacent 57%, which tops Morgan Freeman's 53%. Freeman mounts a worthy comeback with the audience, who did correctly acknowledge Robin Hood's freshness with a 59% average. That's practically fresh, but Jones is fresh here. 62% average with the audience score, and thus, James Earl Jones has his first win of the day, takes round two, and ties the score one to one. Get busy living, or get busy dying. Round three, iconic roles. All right, we got us a tight ball game here. It's probably gonna go down to the wire, and it's at this juncture that I should point out, this round is all about the most iconic roles these gentlemen have ever played. And have you seen their resumes? I can't and will not get to every great performance they've turned in over the years. Otherwise, this vid would be nine days long, and I have a date this weekend. It's a play date with my dog and another puppy, but still filed under the category of date. Find me on the apps. Speaking of appetizers, let's open this feast with the roles you know and love the most. Morgan Freeman as the president in Angel Has Fallen. No? Look, he's in all three of those so far. I hear there's a fourth one on the way. And I do mention it without irony simply because his presence in action flicks like these add weight and dimension and prestige to the proceedings. Would Unforgiven be as legendary a Western without Ned Logan being the best BFF of all time? Imagine Shawshank without Red and his ability to acquire certain goods from time to time. As Scrap Iron in Million Dollar Baby and Hoke Colburn in Driving Miss Daisy, you feel the experience of a life well lived, but not without tragedy and heartbreak in every sequence. And I'll guarantee you that I wouldn't be nearly as high on Robin Hood P.O.T., that's Prince of Thieves for short, without Azim the Great One, let's face it, leading Robin of Loxley in his journey towards becoming an actual adult. Christian Slater is in there too, did I mention that? 
And Slater and Morgan would be reunited in Hard Rain, a film that features some of the toughest droplets ever put to screen. Come on, guys! The clock is ticking! Sometimes Freeman can show up and be the pleasant elder father figure, like in Dolphin Tale or Las Vegas. Other times he can get hard-boiled, like in Lean on Me, The Sum of All Fears, or Red. Then we arrive at possibly his best work effort, 1989's Glory. Anyone who might have needed a second to think of who Morgan Freeman was back then would never forget after witnessing Sergeant Major John Rawlins. It's a stirring portrayal of conflict on both the battlefield and inside one's own heart. James Earl Jones has a similar way of lending presence to any film he's attached to. That can include being a shirtless warrior in Conan the Barbarian, for which he and Arnold Schwarzenegger both won Oscars. I'm now being told that didn't happen, but hey, if you can inhabit a role named Thulsa Doom and hold your own next to a seven-time Mr. Olympia, you're doing just fine. Wendell Pierce is now Jack Ryan's right hand on the cool Amazon show, but Jones originated it on the big screen, and it really doesn't matter if he's on the front lines, making tough decisions with Jack, or relegated to an advisory role from a hospital bed. He still provides an invaluable confidant for Tom Clancy's most famous son. He's also been in the NSA, on the silver screen anyway, thanks to the fun 90s tech thriller Sneakers. And let's not forget about Reverend Stephen Kamalo in Cry the Beloved Country. The 1995 film wrestles with South African apartheid and family issues, and Jones Jones's line delivery is stunning. For example, when he retorts truth, but how can he have truth on his side and not God? It's compelling stuff. Thank you. Morgan plays God occasionally, and when he shows up in the Almighty's, eh, more Bruce than Evan, you believe it. It's just that simple. It's a nice companion to his documentary voiceovers. Does anyone else watch the Penguin movies and think, you know, this guy narrating might have created those adorable flightless birds along with everything else under the sun? I know I do. And we all credit Alfred with being Bruce Wayne's main hang, but where would Batman be without the genius of Lucius Fox? That's the special project guy who birthed him his car, his suit, whatever that flying thing is. As we've come to expect from a Freeman role, he's a principled man who will only go so far to aid bats, stopping short of the tempting technology that would allow him to spy on literally everyone with a cell phone. Even a flip phone? Even a flip phone. But this round is all about the most iconic roles of all time. And yes, Shawshank would be a much less exciting place without Red, the school and lean on me might not exist, and Robin Hood would be dead. He'd just be dead without Morgan Freeman's help. If you would be Freeman, then you must fight! But James Earl Jones is on both sides of the all-time cinematic father coin. If you flip it and it lands on heads, sweet, you get Mufasa. A proven leader, benevolent ruler, who will do everything in his considerable power to aid his kingdom in this life or the next. You are my son. I am your father. If the coin lands on tails, you're getting a very different daddy. No! Darth Vader, possibly the greatest villain this or any other galaxy has ever seen, and the fear he instills doesn't last without that voice. With it, Vader is the be-all end-all when it comes to power, violence, and obsession. I know the Emperor technically ranks higher on the Sith scale, but remember how that worked out for him? <laughs> he ain't Kaplan anymore. Neither are any of the Rebels unfortunate enough to participate in borrowing some schematics that may or may not have contained information about the Death Star. Darth Vader's a guy you do not want to get on the wrong side of, and it's just one of the many memorable roles played by James Earl Jones. His Terrence Mann in Field of Dreams gives a rousing speech about the importance of baseball in American life. For all Earthlings, a similar talk could be delivered about the vitality of James Earl Jones' characters to cinema. Great efforts by both men here, but Jones gets the win and now takes the lead 2-1. to one. It is settled. Round four, Penguin Suit. Okay, you see this round title and you think, oh, Morgan Freeman's gonna easily win this and he's gonna tie the match. Has James Earl Jones ever seen a penguin before? Well, he doesn't necessarily have to, you see. Penguins look like they're wearing cute little dinner jackets, kind of like the tuxedos demanded by the finest award shows in Hollywood. And this phase is all about how well you fared when it came to Tinseltown Super Bowl, the Academy Awards. I'd actually be all in favor of changing the award from an Oscar to a penguin. How cute would that be? And the wobbly bird thing goes to both Morgan Freeman and James Earl Jones. They each have at least one statue that resembles a nude C-3PO on their mantle. I assume that's where you put it. I haven't been invited to their residences as of yet. I keep checking that mail though, any day now. Get yourself in here. 
In the meantime, let's take a walk down memory lane, a road that will detail the careers these two gems have had, as well as the award show itself. And we start in 1970. That was the year that James Earl Jones earned his first Oscar nomination for his lead role as Jack Johnson in The Great White Hope. Fun fact about this, he won a Tony for the same damn role a couple years earlier. Suffice to say, dude knew his lines and was clearly up to the task, but these are two very different mediums. On screen, it's all about the details, the close-ups. Every nook and cranny of one's face are judged, and the Academy decided that his was one of the five best lead performances of that year. On stage, you gotta be able to project to the back of the room. Could James Earl Jones pull that up? What, are we kidding? You know who we're talking about? Of course he could. He would go on to lose the best actor nod that year to George C. Scott, who won for Patton, but didn't show up to the ceremony. It was a whole thing. Jones has not been nominated for an Oscar since, which sounds like an oversight, but luckily they did bestow him with an honorary Oscar, a sort of a lifetime achievement thing at the 2011 ceremony. Morgan Freeman had to wait until 1987 for his first taste of Oscar finalism when he was up for Best Supporting Actor for Street Smart. Sean Connery won that year for The Untouchables. Then again, he got nominated in 1989 for Driving Miss Daisy and 1994 for The Shawshank Redemption, the good news is both nominations were for lead actor. The bad news is two guys named Daniel Day-Lewis and Tom Hanks won those respective years. Shawshank stands have long had a beef with Forrest Gump because that flick was more successful commercially and on the gala circuit. I love both movies, imagine that. Freeman would be denied no more once he was up for Best Supporting Actor with Million Dollar Baby. He took home the gold and was most recently nominated for Best Actor courtesy of Invictus losing out to another venerable actor who was waiting to finally earn a gold fella, Jeff Bridges, for Crazy Heart. A movie that's about a country singer, but could easily be about stand-up comedy as well. Trust me. So Morgan has the edge here, but James Earl Jones is sort of an EGOT. That shorthand for an Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, and Tony. They ding you for not having an Oscar for one particular performance. I will do no such thing. But Morgan Freeman has been a threat to win an Oscar just about every year since Street Smart. Five-time Oscar nominee, not to mention his other award show wins, such as the Cecil B. DeMille Award, which is the Golden Globes version of a Lifetime Achievement Award. The Golden Globes, they know movies and they know how to reward them. Just ask the hilarious comedy The Martian. <laughs> Well, Morgan would probably be recognized on any of the nine planets in this solar system. Is it eight now or is it back to nine? What's Pluto's status? Here on Earth, Freeman gets the win in round four and we're all tied up heading into the final stage. That's goddamn right. And now it's time for the wild card round. Now you see me. Hey, that's another Morgan Freeman franchise. But since he appears in those films, they're not eligible in the round that's all about now you don't see me, as in the best voiceover artist. This is gonna be impossible, really? All right, I'll give it a shot. Morgan Freeman has narrated films about purposefully walking penguins, conveniently titled March of the Penguins. Big feather in his cap. But he's also behind the scenes for America's musical journey, The C Word, Born to be Wild, and War of the Worlds. He can also do voiceovers lampooning his own ability in comedies like the Lego movie. And remember how James Earl Jones was in Conan the Barbarian? They remade the movie in 2011 with Jason Momoa. No one really asked for it, but it was there, and Freeman narrated it. His voice is so recognizable that actors have been hired to impersonate him when they can't land the real McCoy. <gasps> I take the bread. The whole loaf, oh, you understand? Yes. You want money, you come to me. Remember a string of commercials from a certain very well-known credit card company? That's not Morgan Freeman, but it sounded enough like it. And as a result, my credit karma score has plummeted. You forget that eventually you gotta pay for that stuff with real money. Thanks for nothing, fake Morgan Freeman. I saved this last Freeman mention because it's a nice segue. He narrates Cosmic Voyage, which is wonderful, and you might see where I'm going with this. Vader's on that ship. Well done, Luke. Very astute, and the once Anakin Skywalker has turned his disdain for sand into an all-encompassing dark side fueled obsession with ruling the galaxy. The most imposing baddie ever could only be voiced by James Earl Jones. And what sways me towards Jones winning this round is his ability to take that same tenor to form the compassionate yet alpha Mufasa. Morgan Freeman can lend his talents for dramatic or comedic purposes with equal aplomb, but Jones can go good or bad guy or remind you that you're watching CNN. Both gents have dabbled in the religious texts with Freeman hosting an investigative series on biblical scrolls and the like. But Jones has a massively listened to narration of the King James Bible start to finish. Can you imagine that voice reading the book of Apocalypse? That's enough for me to get James Earl Jones the win in this round, and thus, James Earl Jones 
takes the match. They're both winners today. Morgan Freeman and James Earl Jones together have narrated our very lives, it seems. So let's give their vocal cords a rest and turn it over to you, dear viewer. Who's your all-time favorite between the two? It's kind of odd I picked the guy who read the Bible as opposed to the dude who's famous for playing God. I really hope that ruling doesn't come back to haunt me. Hit us up at RottenTomatoes.com. Check out our website, all the cool things we got going. Everything in the world of TV and movies in between. And thank you for watching Versus. I'm your host, Mark Ellis. And until next time, you knew it was going to happen. Penguin dance to the side and the other side. They're cute.